how safe is safe when it comes to coronavirus? And when is safe too safe? Italy has closed all schools and universities for at least two weeks. Saudi Arabia and Iran suspending pilgrimages to holy sites. Israel has either banned travelers from affected area or ordered them to self-quarantine, while French authorities, uh, as they ponder whether to go to their highest level of alert, are regulating the commerce of masks and sanitizing gels. Yet, as the death toll mounts, we're still asking just how dangerous COVID-19 really is. What have we learned since the initial outbreak back in December? And uh, how much is an unforeseen virus testing the institutions we rely on? Public health care, the supply chains of global commerce. Last week's slump in stocks and oil prices points uh, to a real scaling back of global activity. For how long? And uh, where do policymakers at this point uh, put the focus? And while France takes part in the race to find a cure and a vaccine for COVID-19, public researchers were on strike this Thursday against funding cuts. This has hospital workers worry about the rollback of the welfare state. If super viruses do indeed become the new normal, then uh, what's the long view from policymakers? Today in the France 24 debate, are we headed towards a planet in quarantine? And joining us, Dr. Jean-Jacques Zambrovsky, a, a professor of health economics and policy at Paris Descartes University. Welcome back to the show. We uh, want to welcome uh, as well journalist uh, George Cazolius, who is uh, with us here in the studio. Uh, Francesco Saracino, a deputy director of the French Economics Observatory and professor of macroeconomics at the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po. Thanks for joining us as well. And uh, uh, joining us, uh, from uh, Lancaster University in England, Dr. Mohamed Munir, a virologist. Uh, welcome back to the show, sir. The France 24 debate on Dr. Facebook and on Twitter. The hashtag is F24 uh, debate in Italy, uh, the, uh, where the outbreak has been the worst in Europe. The death toll has risen to 148. Uh, it's the first day of no school there. Emerald Maxwell has that story. With the virus now in all but one of Italy's 20 regions, streets and squares across the country are half deserted. Many Italians are choosing to stay at home after the government announced emergency measures, with the warning that there mightn't be enough intensive care units for patients if the virus continues its exponential spread. We're all worried, but there's no alarmism or hysteria. We just want to understand the situation. With the elderly particularly vulnerable to COVID-19, and with the world's oldest population after Japan, Italy is limiting visits to people in nursing homes. The more than 100 people who have died in the country so far were all elderly and or ill with other complications. Italy's also closed all schools and universities until mid-March, leaving 8.4 million students at home. If the coronavirus has to come, so be it. I'm young and can handle it. On the other hand, the university closure does worry me because I'll fall behind. The few people braving Italy's tourist sites are reaping the rewards of near-empty attractions. But the drop in visitors is hurting businesses. We're even getting cancellations for bookings made for next year. We've lost Easter, but we hope things will improve in the summer. Italy's concluding match against England and the Six Nations has also been suspended, after organizers ruled that playing it behind closed doors was too great a financial hit. Uh, have you been, Francesco Saracino, have you been speaking to colleagues uh, back in Italy? Yes, I mean, the, the situation is what uh, the... What's, uh, what was shown in the, in the, <clears throat> in the show. I mean, it's, it's, uh, Italy is coming slowly to a halt, and this is, of course, very worrisome. It's, of course, worrisome for students who are... Yeah, because uh, we heard that student in that report saying she's worried about all the classes she's missing. Uh, Can that be caught up, or how does it work? I don't know. I know that some of my colleagues in uh, universities in Milan that have been closed since uh, mid-February already, uh, they have been told that there will be no public event even when the university resumes because all the classrooms will be used for makeup classes. So there will be an attempt, I guess, from this information I get, to, to make up some of the lost classes. But of course, there are questions about the Italian, uh, Italian school system. I mean, the students have to go through the, 
Italian version of the back is called the maturite, matur, maturita. Uh, if, they, if they miss too many days of school, this is going to be jeopardized, and we are asking questions. That said, it seems that it's a measure that is quite consensual among those who understand about that epidemiologist. That's a difficult word to say in English. I mean, there is no much controversy on the fact that this choice was the right choice to, to make. All right, so there is consensus over the fact that it was a good idea to suspend classes for now, Dr. Zambrowski. In Italy, the controversy is, well, there's lots of them, but one of the ones is uh, why, why such a severe outbreak over there? It's difficult to know. It's difficult to criticize our Italian friends and colleagues. Now, they have uh, more than 100 people who died from the coronavirus, so it psychologically is, is something which is very hard to... Because um, in the report that they talked about uh, uh, the fact that it has the world's second oldest population after absolutely. Japan, is that the reason? Because mm. others are saying no, it's because no. health authorities were too slow to pick up on it. What? Well, at the very first time, uh, the diagnosis for the first patient was probably made a little late. But this doesn't explain why now there is 100 people who died from the infection. It's not d um, due to the... Um, the way the Italian healthcare system is made, because it's very similar to what we can see elsewhere in Europe. We don't know exactly. And the question of how old are the Italians as compared with the people in Spain, in France or in Germany, the difference is a couple of months. So the difference, it's not, it, it cannot be the explanation. We don't have any explanation for the moment. And we certainly don't want to criticize what our Italian friends are doing. Now, there will be a meeting at the highest level of politicians, of government uh, uh, heads um, at the end of this week um, to decide a common policy and to try and harmonize uh, the policy against this. But you cannot pe prevent people from traveling. Uh, you cannot prevent goods from traveling. Uh, you cannot close all the borders. And it's a stupid way of doing things. So um, for the moment, we have to cope and to face the situation and, when, and wait until uh, this epidemic disappear, which will take a couple of months. All right. I want Dr. Munir to react to two of the points you made. First of all, uh, Dr. Munir, what, what are your thoughts on why Italy has the most severe outbreak in Europe? And uh, do you agree with Dr. Zambrowski when he says closing the borders is pointless? Well, partly, yes. Uh, I think uh, early preparedness and timely actions are crucial to contain uh, such, con such contagion. Um, uh, it's not about criticizing Italian or Italy, or it's not criticizing China or Iran, South Korea. It's about really looking into where things have gone wrong. Because until we identify those loopholes and those weaknesses, it would be really hard to stop such type of explosion in anywhere in the world. It could happen to UK, it could happen to France, as it has happened to Italy if it is already not happening. So now the question is closing border. Of course, it is not scientifically proven and we don't really see any benefit of having a, a blanket approach to contain and to lock down the, 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 the cities and, and uh, the countries. But one thing that remained very clear is that if you apply a targeted approach, for instance, this, the areas, for example, Lombardy and uh, Rionto and now Bergamo, where the clusters of the, um, the, the, the patients are really high, at that point, a more targeted approach, especially on the more vulnerable community, is really scientifically proven. And that is how the impact of this virus has been minimized in China and being, uh, uh, is, is, is one of the things that we have to certainly do it. So once again, I would to emphasize that during the debate, there is no point, or, or this is not the intentions to criticize anything, it's just to identify the loopholes and the weaknesses. George Cazoles, this idea of a targeted approach to areas where there's the outbreak is more severe, it's what they're talking about here in France as they ponder whether to uh, up the alert level to the maximum level, which is three, uh, in which case uh, you would have, and you already have some school closures, like mm -hmm. in that area northeast of the capital. This, uh, listening to, to Dr. Munir talking about preparedness, what are your thoughts on it? Well, I, initially I found that um, 
I found that they were not very well prepared, and there was quite a bit of mismanagement. I mean, in my own family, we have an example. My son works in an emergency room in a Paris hospital. A man came in with the virus on February 21st. They knew the same day that he had the virus. And these, uh, these first responders continued to work in the emergency room for six days until my son fell ill with the virus and turned himself in at the Salpetriere for the test, and they put him in isolation. Since, and then his daughter fell ill, and so they had to shut down the classes in his, uh, his children's school. Um, that's pure mismanagement. How many people did those first responders in the emergency room contaminate in those six days? They continued to work. What kind of precautions was your son taking? They, they were given no precautions. They were given no precautions, and they knew the same day that that man who had came, come through their emergency room uh, tested positive for the virus. So you'd think that uh, the direction of the hospital would have done something to check those people. And so when, they, my, when my son proved himself uh, to be positive, they sent over 50 people home to just self-isolate themselves. But, yeah, but the, you know, that was just too late. Too late, you say. Your son and your granddaughter, they're okay? Though. Yeah, they're okay. I, the, the, the symptoms were mild, just like everybody tells us the symptoms were mild. You know, it's people like me who get sick. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Zambrowski, listening to, to, to George's story about his family, uh, I, was there? I don't know exactly what other circumstances and why the, the people in this hospital took this the, the decision, but globally speaking, again... Um, and, and, and should be said, uh, George's son is a paramedic. And this is, you know, they're, they're first responders, they're in the front line. What kind of measures are being taken for people like that? Uh, the measures are when people are detected to be positive, that means they're carrying the virus, they're s supposed to stay at home. And if they, uh, if they have a very, um, nothing but, but um, a little uh, contamination, they can still uh, be at work, provided that they, they uh, wear a mask, which is far enough to prevent them from contaminating That's other safe. people. Yes, of course. But by the way, this happens also with the ordinary flu and the majority, let's say it again, 80 to 85% of people will, will, it will not have anything. Now, among those 15 to 20 people who will have, the vast majority, again, 85% of those 20% or 15% have a mild kind of a flu. And only a very small number will have severe uh, symptoms. And of course, the, the uh, elderly people, the people with risks, risk factors such as uh, uh, pulmonary disease, heart disease, diabetes, probably immunosuppression or immunodepression. But those people would also probably have complications with an ordinary okay, flu. So let's, let's look at the numbers. Uh, China this Thursday recording its 3,000th fatality, but the number of cases appears to be leveling off there. And this is the numbers globally, and uh, we see there's a spike elsewhere. The World Health Organization uh, putting the mortality rate officially at 3.4 percent. That surprised researchers who estimated to be somewhere around 1 percent. What are you seeing, Dr. Zambrowski? This is true, but this uh, takes um, um, the account of all the Chinese people who died in the first time, because out of the 3,000 and some patients who died in the world, 2,900, which is the vast majority, died in China. And the healthcare system, the recourse to medical system, to hospitals, there is no private medicine in China. People had to queue up in hospitals and they had the same kind of trouble, which is contamination in the hospital emergency ward, which is the last place where to go. If, if anybody, now it's well known, if anybody has, starts having fever, uh, sneezing, coughing, uh, something like a flu. The best thing to do in France is to call the emergency system and yeah, stay at home. There's a hotline number you can call, a toll-free number. There is a hotline which is devoted to those people who have symptoms, people who call only for having a kind of a indication, who want to have information and so on, have another hotline which works uh, 24 hours a day. But the last thing to be done anywhere, could be the case in Italy or anywhere, is to go to the emergency ward because there, of course, if you are breathing out uh, and splitting onto the patients, what, what happened to uh, our friend's son might happen and you will transmit the virus to someone who has an heart infection, who has a broken arm and anything like that, which is just stupid. So 
people should avoid going to the hospital, call the emergency system and ask them where to go. And in that case, at least in France, what, what happens to be efficient is that people are taken in a special transportation to directly um, an isolated room in the hospital. They don't go through the emergency ward and they don't Maybe make anybody now. running the risk. Maybe this, not now. Did, did, My did, family this, was did, invited to take the metro to come and get tested in the hospital. But did they have any symptom? <laughs> yes. Yes, they had symptoms. That's why they went to get tested. This was how long ago? This was uh, last week. Last and Thursday. were they contaminated? Did they, did they know they were contaminated? Yeah. They, 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 look, he, he knew that the guy uh, a week earlier had it. He felt the symptoms on Thursday and went to get tested. His daughter fell ill. Then she went to get tested. They all took the metro to go get tested. They said, come in, take, get, get, come in and see us. Did they call the um, hotline 15? Uh, they call, I, I don't know which number they called, but the hospital told them to come in. And then because the, the, girl, because the girl was ill, they sent her to neck air, which is a... Which is children's children's hospital. hospital. Because children don't get ill, theoretically, no. from this. So they wanted to check that a little bit closer. But, I mean, maybe that's what they're doing now. But what I'm saying in the beginning, there seems to be a bit of mismanagement in this whole thing. All right. Mohammed Munir, your thoughts on what the true mortality rate might be and, uh, uh, and the trend in, in since the last time you spoke with us a couple of weeks back. Yeah, precisely. I think uh, since uh, uh, other uh, guests were talking about the preparedness and the timely action, I think one thing that's very important to really emphasize at this moment is that if you uh, recall the emergence of this outbreak right from the Wuhan epicenter, in first three uh, weeks, literally nothing was done. And there was a critical mistake, a scientific mistake that really exploded the whole situation. And that mistake was that uh, unproven study was published that human-to-human -human transmission isn't possible. And that was the time, really, majority of the people, they were infected. And that's how the whole uh, world really succumbed to the infection. It's mainly because one scientific mistake um, in this emerging phase and the prevailing phase of the outbreak could lead to drastic impact. And the, the, the way it is being explained that if a positive case with a clinical sign, if it is uh, transporting or moving to a, for, for treatment through public transport, that is what I meant, timely actions and preparedness. And if these are not really incorporated in any country, the situation what Italy is seeing now could happen in anywhere. All right. The, the word is out now. We're going to pick up on it with our panel. When we come back, stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. We're discussing, uh, well, how far you go in trying to contain the coronavirus with Dr. Jean-Jacques Zambrowski, professor of health economics at Paris's Descartes University. Uh, we're also in the company of journalist George Cazolius. Welcome back as well to Francesco Saracino, deputy director of the French Economics Observatory and who teaches at the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po. And virologist uh, Mohamed Mounir is with us uh, from Lancaster University in the UK. Uh, can you ring fence an entire nation? Israel Wednesday only allowing in travelers from states that uh, border uh, Italy if they can prove they've a place to go to self-quarantine. Uh, Israel also outright banning anyone who's been to Iran, Iraq, Syria, or Lebanon in the past uh, 14 days. Uh, that's one measure that was taken. Uh, a lot of people who are fearful uh, out of Australia, where runs on supermarkets have prompted the hashtag toilet paper apocalypse, <laughs> Darwin-based NT News rolling out, if you'll pardon the pun, loo paper on its inside pages this Wednesday. Its editor telling The Guardian the paper was selling well and was certainly, quote, not a crappy addition, George, because <laughs> not bad, not bad, not bad. So there you see it. Yeah. Uh, but but there, you know, there's panic buying. Well, the, the, 
the problem is the confusing messages. You know, let's take France, for example. You can't have uh, uh, indoor events with more than 5,000 people. Does that mean less than 5,000 people, you don't catch it? Then what about stadiums where we're having soccer and rugby matches where there are tens of thousands of people? I mean, it, it, so, so many don't messages Don't say that. I'm due to go to Scotland for the, for the Six Nations. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, but but, but well, football are... matches are played in open air. Yep. And and you cannot lock everyone in in their apartments or in their houses. But the message is it's a, a nonsense. But the message is so are, are confusing. How do you? Why in Italy are they playing uh, the football matches in empty stadiums then? There are two two different things. The political behavior. Governments have to take their responsibilities, and they would certainly be blamed at the next election. Would they take a decision which finally would happen to be inappropriate? Now there is a purely healthcare or medical decision, which might be somehow different. Now, for this moment, we, we have a health minister who's been in place for a couple of weeks now, um, even less than that, who happens to be a hospital physician, is very well aware of the... And he and the president of the Republic had a, a meeting with the best scientists today to see what exactly was the risk, what are the measures, could we do more than what we're doing, and how to avoid those kind of misinformation or mismatches or mismanagements, which cannot be observed. You know, we were not prepared. Nobody was prepared anywhere, not the Chinese, not the uh, Italian, nowhere in the world. Now, and, and we were not prepared. For example, we had this religious event uh, in the east of France a couple of days ago. In People Mulhouse. Went, in Mulhouse. People went to a, an evangelist um, a holy ceremony, which lasts a week. Some people went from the French West Indies or from Guyana there. Then, after the event was closed, nobody felt any symptom. They took back the train, then they took back the plane to uh, Guyana without any symptom. And then after a couple of days, they started feeling bad. But at the same time, some symptoms also um, became clear in, locally in Mulhouse or in this eastern part of France. Who could know that before? Who took the germ into, into this uh, uh, so church. you're making the argument that we that all these public gatherings in indoor spaces should be shut down for a while. But we should not even go, go to a TV studio. Who seated here at, at this place before this microphone one hour ago? I don't know. And yet, I mean, again, the flu, the ordinary flu, which is now on the uh, um, lowering phase, uh, will kill probably 10,000 people in France this year. And it's the rate annually, 10,000 people. For the moment, there are two, um, exactly um, 377 cases, which are, um, of the, globally speaking, out of which six people here died in here in France who owed at risk factors, what we call comorbidities, disease that they would have anything which would um, modify their... So you're making the cool. argument that there is a, a measure of overreaction. Let me ask There is, you, but there has to be. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Munir, tell us the truth here. Have you changed your personal habits in the past weeks? Not at all. Well, uh, the important thing really is to understand how we have tackled uh, past uh, such kind of contagion. There are only three ways uh, ever in the history we have controlled such infections. First is that we would have a natural resistance against the pathogens, and pathogens cannot infect us. The second has been that we have a very good vaccines that we could do. And the third has been that people have changed their behavior. First two options, natural resistance and a vaccine, is not available. We left only with one option, and that is changing behavior. By, by changing behaviors mean it starts from the personal hygiene until avoiding any contact, any possibility for the virus spread. It does not matter whether it is a gathering of three people to a gathering of 5,000 people. It's all about uh, scaling the intensity as to realizing the overall impact it could have. For instance, if three people in a studio are sitting, the risk is only to these three people or the four people. <laughs> when we talk about yeah, right. that sort of game, when we're talking about Absolutely. scaling the intensity that we want to take into. Until we don't change the behavior, this contagion will not go away. Wow, your reaction to that, Francesco Saracino. 
I'm not, I'm not a doctor, so I mean, I just follow the instructions. It, it, it is true that there is major, major disruption. I personally got my marathon in Rome cancelled today, so I was preparing for five months. I mean, and we, we don't go to workshops. We, the economy is stopping. I guess we'll discuss that in a short well, let's while. Well, let's, so. let's, let's talk about that now. In fact, uh, first of all, there's the travel world's first casualty, uh, British regional budget carrier Flybe. Uh, had already been struggling, coronavirus scaring away business, and uh, that proved to be the last straw as passengers brutally discovered when they got to the airport this Thursday morning. It's going to cause a massive fuss, I think. It's a smaller airline, but, you know, for smaller places, we need it. I'm just not sure what we're going to do now. I thought that we'd be saved, but not this time. Should we push them? All right, and there, there, you, there you see a flyby which has gone under, it, there could be more that that, that follow. Uh, Wall Street, let's look at the numbers for that. After a brief respite on Wednesday, uh, headed south again this Thursday. We can uh, uh, look up the latest uh, numbers now. The, yeah, the Dow is down uh, uh, more than 800 points, uh, 3% uh, uh, as we speak. Uh, earlier in the week, the U.S. Federal Reserve deciding on a surprise half percent cut in rates, the emergency uh, slashing of lending rates, uh, the first since the 2008 financial crisis. And uh, to hear the head of the Fed tell it, it's preventive medicine. Begin to uh, spread a bit here in the United States. But for us, what really matters, of course, is, is not the epidemiology, but the, the risk to the economy. So we saw a risk to the, to the outlook for the economy and chose to act. All right, so there, there you hear uh, Jerome Powell there. Uh, saying that uh, uh, we saw a risk for the outlook of the economy and chose to act. Markets didn't like it, though. Why is that? Well, they didn't like it because, I mean, it's... Uh, it's it... Markets don't like uncertainty. And because of the, of the uh, medical reasons, because of the public policy reasons, and because of the economic reasons, the uncertainty is at, at its maximum. So this, so th this, this short uh, boom that they had on Wednesday on the, on the announcement of uh, Biden victory on, on the primaries, I mean, it lasted just a few hours because fundamentally we don't know whether this uh, slowdown will last for weeks, for months, or more. And did and, this Fed rate cut reassure or help spread fear? That's a difficult question. Probably neither. Probably neither. It's it's uh, the question is not preventive action in this case is not very, very is not going to change much. I mean, what what will what will happen? What is happening now, for example, in Italy is that there is a number of especially small businesses that are uh, on the verge of closing. Okay. That might become a permanent damage to the Italian economy. So these businesses need to be helped right away. And who's, uh, to, who's to help them? Uh, in part, there is the fiscal policy action, the, the Italian government. Because the IMF on Wednesday talked about uh, a special fund to help countries. Exactly. Fa uh, the thing is, uh, well, first of all, countries can run deficits. So, I mean, the Italian government has a plan that will increase the deficit. The European Union will probably accept that this deficit is, is increased. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing you can do is you can, you can use fiscal policy. And then I think, this is my own opinion, is that the central bank is crucial, not so much in making money cheap, but in making sure that banks really can channel funds to the small businesses. For some businesses, it's not a question of losing business forever. It's just a question of losing business for a few weeks. So these guys just need to have liquidity to survive three, four, five weeks. And so this, this situation might not be very uh, serious if they're tackled properly. If they're not, they will go out of business and the damage will become permanent. Yeah, because today the Minister of Health in France was talking about helping employers financially pay the salaries of people who self-isolate themselves uh, in, in, in quarantine. Yeah, but, really but, but where are they going to get this money from? I, I mean, France is <laughs> a bankrupt. Where are they going to get this no, money from? France is not bankrupt. Okay, I mean, the debt is 100% of GDP. You know, I mean, how, how long are the Germans going to pay for that? Well, it's not the Germans, so we don't, don't, let's not start on that. It's a, it's a different topic. We don't have time. But, 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 no, you, no, wait, when no. you close schools... Uh, I'm not talking about universities, but when you close schools, you have the children staying at home. They can't stay alone if they are young children. So you need at least one of their parents to stay at home with them. Now, the Italian government also has to face the fact that they have just been allowing one of the parents at least to stay at home, to, 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 to stay by their children who are not ill, 
because just the school is closed. And this is nas national. In, in, in our country, we are closing the schools in, in the clusters, in this uh, acute area. And of course, the parents will have um, uh, daily so, allowances that by the time they have to set home. But in right. Italy, when you close all of the schools, you, you, you say that 50% of the Italian population having young children will stay at home. So, so George Cazzoli is uh, asking, like asking an important question, we, which is, does the world economy have the spine, the backbone, what it takes to, uh, with, to withstand a long-term disruption? Th this is a very serious shock to the world economy because it hits, at the same time, demand and supply. People don't go out and shop, firms don't invest, and the productive capacity of firms and of the productive system is diminished. So that, that is why it's a more complicated policy response than usual, because you have to make sure that you support both supply and demand. If you, for example, if you do a standard uh, stimulus, supposing you can, I think you can actually afford it, but, 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 <clears throat> but the production is not, there, uh, is not there because you didn't manage to support production, these stimulus will, uh, will end up in not supporting the economy. And the, and the shock is very serious. I saw two images that were striking, I mean, very, very visual. Huh? It's pictures before and after the outbreak of Lombardy, which is the richest region in Italy, one of the richest in, in Europe, actually. Before the outbreak, you had all these uh, smog, uh, satellite images, all this smog and pollution. After the outbreak, it, everything was clear. <laughs> and the same on, on, on a NASA image of China. Uh, so the economic activity is stopping. The, the impact on GDP uh, is already estimated to be uh, uh, between 0 0.2 and 0 0.5, depending on whether it will uh, end soon or not, and it could be much lower, uh, higher. So we need to intervene, but it's not easy. And that's why I was saying what policy can do today is mostly make sure that the flow of credit to firms who are in temporary difficulties, the, the little do ones. not stop, and mostly this is, of course, of course, small and medium enterprises, right. which, as we know, in Italy, for example, in part also in France, are a, the backbone of the economy. Yeah, it, it's true for um, at least in France as well, uh, for tourism, for all kind of small industries. But when mm. you are manufacturing a car in Italy, in Germany, or in France, maybe even in the UK, all the car is manufactured there. But a small screw, a small bolt is made in China. And because the logistics chain is interrupted somewhere between Wuhan and, and here, just for a simple screw, you cannot terminate mm. a car which could be all assembled. And, and, and this uh, asks the question, raises the question of relocate in Europe part of the production. It's a complete um, mode of thinking which this crisis, when it will be finished, um, will, and this is why all the uh, political authorities um, are meeting um, how to face something, this crisis, and same similar crisis that might happen in a close future, in a close even for the drugs. Yeah, so we, Mohamed Munir, we don't know at this point uh, uh, whether or not it'll be contained. We're, we're hearing reports, uh, you're a virologist, maybe you could tell us, that uh, when it, the warmer months come around, it will taper off. Is that true? Well, we do know that there are uh, different diseases that have a certain level of seasonability. Seasonability means that if, uh, for example, flu is more common in winter, and that is mainly because, um, because the environment favors and um, uh, we don't precisely know whether the environment will impact onto this COVID-19. First, because it's a new virus. We haven't have run this disease all the way through the year. So we don't have a backlog history of this one. However, we do know that it's spread through the droplets. So droplets, when come into the air, if it is colder, it would stay longer. So therefore, the chances for the nearby people would, to contract the infection would be higher. As the uh, weather changes, the, the droplets in the air would stay for the less time. And if it stay for the less time, the chances to anyone in the near vicinity would have uh, uh, less to, to contract the infection. So we are anticipating that there would be uh, some positive knock-on effect of the changing weather onto the virus um, um, in terms of uh, transmission intervenance. And if that happened, then we, we will slowly see the impact onto it. I will slowly see the impact at that point. And, and this is the, the other question, George Gazzales, because... 
you know the old saying, you, you, you deal with what's urgent, but not always with what's important. This Thursday, French researchers, you know, the ones who do academic mm. research, long-term research, scientists and all that, mm. they're on strike. They want more money. There's the sense that uh, we're in our crisis management. We're, could we be wasting an opportunity to rethink how we look at the long term? Again, if these viruses are going to come back more and more. Well, I, I mean, the thing is that it's, once again, it's the confusion. The, 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 the people in this country are not united to, in a common effort to, to, to do this. And look at on Tuesday, there was a transport strike in, in Paris. That meant fewer buses and fewer metros meant more people crowded together in, in, the, uh, in the public transportation, which meant more spread of, of the disease. I don't, uh, what I see is people are confused, they're panicking, they're telling us this flu is no be no worse than the other, yet they're taking all these measures that they never take with the other flus. And so people are just confused and frightened and, and not united to, 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 there's not a united <laughs> effort to fight this. Jean do you agree with that, Jean-Jacques Zambowski? No, but everyone is free to have his own opinion. Um, of course, the healthcare system um, is protesting for um, not enough uh, money. Uh, we want more. Um, it's a French speciality, by the way, to ask for more. Uh, we ask more for the schools, we ask more for the hospitals, we ask more... This has been going on for months, though. So. Yeah, it's for, it's for years, mm -hmm. and it's been the case whoever is governing uh, the country. Um, but there is um, um, an increase in the protests. It was more violent in the recent month. Everyone knows about that. And it's, I agree with the fact that there should be more unanimity, more um, common response. But also more investment in long-term research rather than just how to deal with, you know, more face masks uh, and, this and, I disagree and, with, and hand sanitizing gels. This I cannot agree with you. Okay. Um, the um, uh, Pasteur Institute, for example, makes a very long-term research and some other academic uh, centers make a long-term research uh, and have been discovering viruses for years and decades, not to mention the HIV virus and some other very important uh, infectious uh, particles. Uh, so there is a long term. You must make a distinction between the long term fundamental research and the potential applications, industrial production of something, which would be uh, um, um, a deduction from this theoretical research. But the academic research is at a very high level, and same in Italy, by the way, same elsewhere in Europe. But at least in the country I know best, the academic level, the, the scientific level, is very high, very well known. What we are not good at is translating the research into something practical, something which can be used, something which can be sold at a reasonable price, while some other countries are very good at doing that. Well, what the, are the Germans doing that we're not doing? Because they seem to be doing a lot But they don't make a lot of fundamental research. Have you ever heard of a virus discovered in Germany? Never. Francesco Never. Saracino, you, you, no, I, your I, thoughts on this? I instead agree with you. I mean, there is a long-term problem of uh, financing this excellent research. This ex the research is excellent, but it's... Inc I mean, the uh, university is increasingly the valve to for cost cutting governments. I mean, whenever you don't know where to cut, you cut some, you give, you take away some resources from universities. These guys protest in the street, but nobody notices because they don't block the, uh, the the subway system and so on and so forth. And this has been going on in Italy and in France in some sense for many years. At a certain point, this excellent research will stop existing because of lack of resources. We are not there yet. I agree. And the I'm amazed and and surprised by how many good researchers still reach interesting results, not just in medicine or economics, in many fields, for example, in my country. But I mean, this is not going to last forever. And it's not cost cutting that should uh, uh, be the, the wrong place to cut costs. And it's not cost cutting that should be the, if you want, a guiding principle for uh, long term uh, research policies. All right, something we can talk about more. Uh, I, I want to thank you, Francesco Saracino. Jean-Jacques uh, Zambrowski, I want to thank uh, Mohamed Munir for being with us uh, from Lancaster and George Kazolius. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. Yes.
We say hello to James Creedon. Hi, Francois. So just to look at how uh, the coronavirus virus, uh, coverage is, is going online. And, and of course, uh, just to start here in France, uh, we've, we've had Emmanuel Macron basically saying that it's, 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 it's inevitable now that there's going to be an epidemic. And uh, he has been tweeting as well about uh, concrete measures in particular, I suppose, that, that they're kind of trying to fight back against people stockpiling uh, masks and whatnot and masks just not being available. So um, that was a, a tweet he, he put up. In the last regulating so. the price of those hand sanitizing jobs. That's exactly it. Uh, that that too has been um, communicated by the, uh, the by the finance minister Bruno Le Maire. And it, but some people kind of being a little bit tongue in cheek here, saying uh, that they could trade one of these sort of hand sanitizers for I don't know an Audi or a Mercedes car. It, it's a, it's a joke, obviously, but the cost of these hand sanitizers had just shot up on sites such as uh, Le Bon Coin which is, I guess, a French equivalent of Craigslist. So it's serious, it's, it's serious stuff as well in terms of um, all of that. Now, concerts and uh, concert venues uh, across France have also been uh, cancelled, as the new news coverage has been showing. Uh, Accor Hotel Arena, uh, which is one of the biggest venues in Paris, has had to push back all of its um, con concerts uh, until the end of May, which has generated quite a bit of upset online because some people feel also that because ma football matches are being maintained for now that there's a, perhaps a lack of coherence in that regard. Because those are outdoors. Right, well, there you go. Some people are annoyed, uh, <laughs> reasonably or unreasonably. Uh, and of course, then, the big buzz of the, la of the last day or two has been uh, uh, the toilet paper uh, frenzy <laughs> in uh, Australia. In particular, why it started there is unclear, but there was even a man tasered in a fight that no. took place Yes, yeah. uh, the, somebody was tasered after an argument broke out over toilet paper at a big W store. So it's really sort of pathetic, I think it's fair to say, and a lot of people would agree about that. So these are photos from supermarkets down under with people buying just ridiculous quantities of toilet paper, uh, which I think surpass requirements, even if you are quarantined for 14 days or forever, you probably not <laughs> need that much toilet paper. Uh, so in any case, as some people pointed out, just the logic having left the building, really, if you do need that much toilet paper, coronavirus <laughs> is actually the least of your problems. Uh, in <laughs> So, you know, it definitely <laughs> is it, it, it did lead to quite a lot of people joking and mocking Australians for reacting <laughs> in such in such a way. Um, so there you go. But it's spread. This uh, contagion has spread to the UK as well. And this is uh, somebody calling the people who preceded him along the aisle <laughs> cretins, which is probably uh, at least partially true, let's be honest. Now, uh, The Guardian has uh, interviewed uh, behavioural experts because indeed you know, this is something that requires a degree of explanation. And uh, because it's not an expensive item, it doesn't deteriorate. You will eventually get through it, supposedly. Uh, this is one of the reasons. And it's seen, as an, in, it's seen as an essential Australia, product. Not like in Paris. Right. Say again? The cost of stocking toilet paper when the price of the square meter is so high is very right. high. <laughs> right. So it, it, I, I suppose it's not going to... It's not going to but it is easier to stock up than Dutch tulips. That's it. That's, right. <laughs> That's it. Uh, <laughs> Could the film Contagion uh, has shot up to, I think it's now one of the most viewed uh, films on iTunes, having disappeared off uh, the charts. It's from the, what, 2012? It's, it's like 10 year old film, something yeah. like that. And so that's come right back up just as people are reading Camus' The Plague uh, and all sorts of other kind of uh, movies that would be, or, or cultural uh, items that would be somewhat dystopian. <clears throat> Something that is a little bit more hopeful, even if it's not directly connected, is that the last case of Ebola has been uh, cured now in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And ah. so that has also been getting a certain amount of co coverage in parallel uh, with some lovely images of uh, the lady um, dancing as she emerges from a uh, clinic. So basically, you have to wait for 42 days to be sure uh, that, it's, that it's wiped. <laughs> right, exactly. So, uh, you know, it's somewhat reassuring to see that uh, things are going in the right direction for, uh, for, that, for that. Also, pretty impressive images coming from Mexico. Uh, as uh, uh, basically it's been clear that have been barred yeah that's right so th that's they're, they're pretty much uh, almost very very rare images because usually it's a lot more like that lots more people wow yeah. James Creedon many thanks. thanks we'll have more on this story coming up I want to thank our panel once again thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate